food is actually coming from China. Right? So we really are, in terms of production, way behind you know, many countries that are out there. And that's something that I'll talk about today, is that we really have to look at this, take it seriously, and say, is fish farming an area that we want to increase? Is seafood in our diet something we want more of, or at least even hold steady? Okay? It also is one of the few times that I can put a chart together, and I use charts when I'm teaching all the time, and I like to put top 10 lists up there. It's one of the few charts in which I have in which Myanmar, Bangladesh, surpassed the US in production. <laughs> all right? That's not, you know, China, India are usually up there, Norway sometimes too, but when you have these tiny little countries producing far more than we are, it starts to make a little bit of a statement. All right, now, what about you? What about you when you go to the store and you buy seafood? Okay, well here's some sobering statistics for you. And that is, surprisingly, fish and fish products are the single largest food commodity that are traded internationally. Okay, if you put a chart up there of what are some of the most traded products on the planet, I could probably ask you, at least I'm hoping, I'm going to let you redeem yourselves after that first quiz that you took. <laughs> what is the number one item that is traded internationally? Come on. Oil. oil there we go. <laughs> all right, we're all used to that. You hear about the, you know, a barrel of oil going up or down, and you watch the prices at the pump go up and down. Well, they usually go up. That down part's only kind of a recent thing. <laughs> all right. It's hard to believe that if you get that top five list of, of internationally traded products, that seafood actually pops up on that list. And it's the number one food commodity that's being traded. Okay? Now again, remember that map of the world that I showed you? Where are the big bubbles? They're not in the US. So what does it turn out? Well, 80% of our seafood in this country is imported. Okay? Because again, we're not producing it. It's coming from foreign countries. Okay? This is the statistic that, I don't know, if there's going to be something that keeps you up at night, this should probably be one of them if you like seafood. And that is, is that if you ask the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, when all these ships are coming in with seafood, what's being inspected for food safety? Well, they'll admit about 1% of that seafood actually gets inspected. Okay, they said they just don't have the manpower, they just don't have the time, based on the quantity of seafood coming into this country. That's a little bit of a scary statistic there. The other part which I put this up here, and this is the most recent data available, is, is that this trade imbalance just continues to grow. Right? We just keep importing more and more seafood, and we are not producing it. We're just having a higher and higher demand each year. So that number, that the trade imbalance just continues to grow. Okay, so a lot of problems we have there. Where do we actually make a change? How is the U.S. suddenly going to become a major player in seafood production? How can we start producing our own food and not importing all of it? Well, there's been a quite a number of surveys, just about every year one comes out, in which they ask leading experts, what has to change in the United States? How do we get from number 15 at least into the top 10? Okay? And these are the ones, every year they show back up on the list. They said, number one, we need technological innovation. Okay? We need to be able to produce more of these fish. And the technology is, just isn't there yet. Okay, and we're going to talk about a little bit about some of the technology. They also say that a lot of this information, a lot of this innovation is going on at universities. But universities aren't getting it out there to fish farmers. They're getting it out there to other academics. So they said technology transfer needs to improve in this country so it goes from university to the farm. Okay? Now where do they want to see that technology change? They want to see it in the areas of breeding, disease control, feeds and fish nutrition, and what they call low impact production systems. Okay? What else do they say? Well, we need spatial planning. They said, and that is, is where are the best places to put the fish farms? Okay? I just happen to put one up here because it's one of the projects I've been trying to tackle for the past five years, and that is, is that we are currently in the process of putting together a, what's called a GIS model for Wisconsin aquaculture, and to identify those places in the state which are better locations for fish farms than others. And as you can see, there's a lot of information that you have to put it together into one of these models to identify those locations. Okay. The other areas is, is they say, well, if the U.S. is going to grow, it should be a sustainable industry. Therefore, sustainability should be rewarded. Right? Let's go back to those questions. Do you want to pollute the environment? How are you going to affect the economics and the social impacts? And then the last is kind of an interesting one, and that is, is the shift to low trophic species. Right? Just briefly, what does that mean? 
and actually means changing the mind of the consumer. And that is often the most difficult thing to do. And that is, is that if you go you know, to the supermarket, look at what fish they have in the seafood counter. In the US, you're going to see salmon, you're going to see trout, you're going to see things such as tuna steaks that are there, swordfish. Okay? These are high trophic species. They're at the top of the food chain. Right? They cost a lot to raise. But that's how we view seafood. You go to other countries, and what do you see on their list? They have things such as catfish, tilapia. Right? Those are low trophic species. Right? They're less costly to raise. Right? So we actually have to change the mindset of the consumer to say there's nothing wrong with low trophic species. Stop craving your tuna and swordfish or salmon fillets. Okay, so now what I wanted to do is, is that sometimes when I give presentations about aquaculture, there's usually people who say, well, I'm still not sold on it. Aquaculture has a lot of problems, and I want those addressed first. So I thought, in this presentation, let's just talk about some of those problems, because the other thing that's out there is that there are truths and there are myths that are being passed around to the public about U.S. seafood. Okay? For example, one is, as they say, What's the prime ingredient in fish food? Fish. Right? So they say, why are we harvesting wild fish and turning them into food to feed fish that we then eat? That just seems like we could cut down a couple of steps there. Well, the fact is, is that it only takes about a half a metric ton of wild fish to raise one metric ton of farmed fish. Okay? So it's not that high. A lot of people will see that and they'll actually say, well, isn't it one to one? Or aren't we harvesting three times the amount of wild fish to raise one times the amount of farm fish? It's not that bad, actually. It's half of it. So in other words, aquaculture is actually a net producer of protein. Okay? The other half of their diet isn't made out of fish. Fish are also the best at feed conversion. So if you compare them one to one with, let's say, a cow or a chicken or a pig, fish actually convert most of their feed into growth. Okay? Realistic numbers for fish are in the area of what they call 1.1 to 1.5. What does that mean? You need 1.5 pounds of food to grow one pound of fish. Right? Do you know how many pounds of food you need in order to raise one pound of cow or cattle? You know? No? Say 10. Say 10. 10. 10. <laughs> <laughs> right? You need 10 pounds of food to raise one pound of cattle. Right? So fish are much better. Actually, they're the best out of, out of chickens, pigs, and cattle. Fish are actually the best at what's called feed conversion. All right? Now, fish don't actually need fish meal or fish oil. You can substitute other things into their diet. But the fact is, is that fish meal and fish oil contain a perfect balance of what those fish need to grow. So you can give them other things. You can throw corn in there. You can throw soybeans. They'll eat it. They just won't grow as effective as they will using fish meal or fish oil. Right? This is a big one. This one's even published at least twice a year in most major newspapers, magazines. You'll see it on the TV. They say, farm fish aren't safe to eat. Stick with eating wild fish. Okay? Well, the answer to that is, is farmed fish that are farmed in the U.S. are absolutely safe to eat. Right? It's the farmed fish coming from countries like China or Indonesia that you need to worry about. Okay? Well, why is that? Well, basically, on the list, and I'll show you the list in a minute of fish to avoid to eat, the only one that's on there that is U.S. raised is Atlantic salmon. But it's not on there because it's contaminated. It's on there because Atlantic salmon are generally raised off the coast, and people are worried about the coastline being degraded. Okay? And that's a different point to avoid them than it is that they're contaminated. Right? The U.S. seafood, the industry is regulated by four different U.S. agencies. Okay? Try to find almost any other product made in the USA that's regulated by four agencies. There really isn't any other. Okay? So when people ask me, well, is it safe to eat? I say it is absolutely safe to eat U.S. farm-raised seafood. If it comes from another country, often I'll pass by it at the seafood counter and say, no, I'll wait and see if you get U.S. seafood in there. Because we don't regulate other countries. We can't. And then you've got to keep in mind, only 1% of what we import from them actually gets inspected. Okay? So if there is a concern about safe seafood, it should be of farm-raised seafood. Again, kind of along the same lines, people say, well, farm-raised fish are contaminated. 
They have PCBs, they have mercury in them, they have all different types of antibiotics. Well, it's just not true, right? In the US, you are not allowed to use growth hormones. Antibiotic use is only applied if the fish have broken out with a disease. Most foreign countries actually apply antibiotics prophylactically in an attempt to keep diseases down. Okay? So here's that kind of one of those lists. Here's the major list of fish to avoid eating from farms because they may be contaminated. All right? The general list is king mackerel, shark, swordfish, halibut, and tuna. I think if you cross tuna off of that list, just because people do eat tuna out of a can, the other fish, I, I just don't know how often most of you or even I eat those fish. All right? So most of the top ones on the avoid list aren't even fish that people eat in great abundance. Okay? Whereas if you look at most of the ones that are over here on the healthiest fish category, most of those are farm-raised fish, and a lot of people will have those regularly in their diet. Okay? So most fish, again, are not contaminated. U.S. fish aren't. They're usually the ones that are safe to eat. Right? Other ones are, again, people say, I don't want a fish farm in my backyard because they'll contaminate the environment. Okay? Well, really, whenever those articles come out, the only type of aquaculture they're criticizing is what's referred to as net pen aquaculture. Okay? Net pen aquaculture looks just like that. It's a pen that's floating in the water. And what I can tell you about it is, is the place they do it in the U.S. is in the ocean. Okay? So we don't even need to worry about it here in Wisconsin. But they do it in the ocean. And it is probably the area of aquaculture that has received the most technological research to it in the past 20 years. The U.S. is concerned about it and wants actually to limit the amount of contamination. So they've come up with a variety of things from different types of diets to different types of cages in order to put these fish in to minimize that impact. So there is a lot of work going into preventing ecosystem harm, but the most of the criticism is in the area of net pens, not in things we're going to see here in Wisconsin. Right? And then the last one is, is people say, well, farm fish just don't taste good. They don't taste like the wild fish. And then I'll usually ask them and say, what kind of farm, you know, fish do you eat? You say you just like the wild fish, not the farmed. Well, every one that I put an asterisk on this list are basically fish that are primarily farmed. So people will say, well, I really like shrimp and salmon. Those are my two favorite. I'll be like, they're farmed, they're farmed. <laughs> All right? So people don't even know where their seafood's coming from. They don't realize most of it's coming from farmed areas. Okay. The only one I put a little uh, question mark there is clams. Clams is kind of a toss-up. 50% of them come from the wild. 50% are actually farm-raised clams. Right? But most of the others are dominated, basically, by farm-raised fish. This point was actually covered really well about a year and a half ago. And if you're familiar at all with this concern about what's referred to as Asian carp, coming up the Mississippi River and into the Great Lakes, it's a, it's a very big concern because it's such an invasive species. Um, Illinois was, is so concerned about it because their section or stretch of the Mississippi is just full of Asian carp. So a year and a half ago, they were trying to find ways to get the public involved. And they had a uh, taste testing competition in which they had uh, very good chefs throughout Illinois prepare dishes they traditionally do, such as things such as salmon or trout, and then prepare the same dish with Asian carp. And then they covered them so people couldn't see it, and they did one of those blind taste tests where they stuck the fork in and said, try this, and try this. And almost 75% of the time, people said they liked the dish with the Asian carp better than all the other ones. Right? They didn't know they were eating Asian carp, but that was actually the results that came out of it. Right? So the question really has to come back, fish, farm fish don't taste good. Do people really have that you know, good of a palate that they can tell the difference between a farmed and a wild fish? I think if you did a blind taste test with most things, most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two of them. And in some cases like this, they're actually picking a, an exotic species that they don't even want in the river. Okay, so Chris had mentioned during the introduction, kind of bringing it home a little bit here, and that is, well, what are we doing in Wisconsin? Well, UW-Stevens Point is really quite unique in that we have an aquaculture research field station. Chris mentioned it's actually in Bayfield, Wisconsin. So as I tell people when they ask me, well, how do I get to it? I say, drive north. When you fall into a really large lake, we're right there. <laughs> right? It literally is on the shores of Lake Superior. Right? And the facility was essentially constructed in order to advance areas such as applied research, demonstration, outreach, and education. 
Okay? We try to bring a lot of, well, we try to bring the students up to the facility. We try to bring our findings from the facility out to the rest of the state. And just a real brief overview of it, when it was built, it was designed to cover all aspects of Wisconsin aquaculture. So there are ponds on the property to cover pond raising of fish. There are back down here, there are what are referred to as flow through or artificial rivers that are on the property to raise river fish. And then there's a large building there, which I'll show you some pictures in a second, in which they do tank culturing. So there's tanks that they actually raise the fish in. Give you a little bit better picture of them. These are the tanks. They're essentially located in this building. And this is one of the more recent advances in, in, in U.S. aquaculture, which is referred to as recirculating aquaculture, which is basically just that. The water recirculates between filters back into the fish tanks again. So it's what's referred to as a closed containment system. The water never actually leaves it. Right? Other areas I mentioned are more in the areas of ponds. And then we've even gone so far as to build a wetland up there as well and use the wetland for treatment of water to see if natural wetlands can purify water again. So the university has really a unique facility. It's open to the public. If you're ever in northern Wisconsin, please stop by. Um, all of the research, all the demonstration we do up there is for the public. So we are trying really our hardest to do technology transfer, to get out information to the public. Um, you can see here, here are the recycle systems that we have. And again, thinking about aquaculture, you know, any one of these tanks holds like 5,000 fish in it. So it's not small scale, it's commercial scale food production of fish. These are the raceways I was talking about, and in these you basically raise fish that like to live in flowing environments, rivers. So these guys here are holding up some lake trout that were growing in those systems. And then I said ponds. Ponds is more the traditional aspect of people where people raise fish, and you're more likely to find people, you know, fish farmers that have just one pond in their backyard. But we try to help them with modernizing the growth of fish in ponds themselves. All right, again, just a small sampling of the multitude of projects that we do. What we like to do is, is we really like that idea of transferring research to the farmers. So the way we accomplish that is, is that we basically meet with farmers year round and say, you tell us the questions. We're not going to do a research project just to do research. We want you to tell us what to do. So they come to us, the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa wanted to raise lake herring, uh, and a company, Aquaterra, wanted to raise Arctic char. Another company from Vancouver, British Columbia right now has us raising Atlantic salmon for them. And then a company out of Black Creek, Wisconsin has us doing walleye. Again, any farmer, anybody interested can come to us and say, I've got a question. Can you help do this research? Okay. Just to use the last one here as an example, this one has basically progressed, I think, through the research process the most. And that is walleye are one of the more favored fish on like Friday night fish fries. Okay? If you go to western Wisconsin, you go to Minnesota, walleye is going to be on every menu at every bar and grill that you go to. Okay? Walleye have a distinctive problem in that it takes two years to raise a walleye from an egg to an adult walleye, which is what's going to turn into a filet. And two years is one year too much for a farmer. Okay? Think about what a farmer around here raising corn, what it would be like if we were told when, the, when you plant a corn seed, you'll harvest the cob two years later. Right? The industry wouldn't exist. Well, the same thing applies to fish.